nobody has like three good days in a row and like this is a good week hmm. tomorrow's friday right you know what i hope something catastrophic happens friday so i can practice my resiliency like nobody <laughs> right yeah like, that would be real right that like was... nobody wants that that roller coaster ride but life is that roller coaster yes. ride so i've gotten good at managing fear i've i've experienced horrific shit in business my family experienced a home invasion at gunpoint i wasn't there i've experienced violence mm -hmm. i've i've uh uh had uh, a business t like taken from me you know like a, a that was doing 12 million dollars and like a week later was gone uh shit that that like other people like you know take their lives over or right. take someone else's lives over uh i've had to rebuild uh and so i feel like like all of those create fear at, at so many levels so i've gotten good at at managing fear okay i am so pumped to thank one of the new sponsors of the show and that is apollo and the apollo is a wearable device I am obsessed with this. It is something that, mod okay, so basically it goes on your wrist. Again, like I said, it's a wearable and it helps regulate the vagus nerve and it looks like an Apple watch, but it's not. You actually can wear it on your wrist or your ankle. I wear it on both. And what it does is you can program it. I love social and open and it vibrates on your wrist to a certain pattern and this helps modulate your nervous system you can choose to have better sleep to stay calm be focused be more present feel less overwhelmed it was developed by neuroscientists and physicians it is safe it is natural uh, no side effects you can get 40 dollars off the apollo wearable just go to apollo that's a p o l l o n-e-u-r-o dot com slash dr lion this is hands down one of my most favorite products i'm wearing it now it is great to modulate how you feel you will love love experimenting and playing with it so go to apolloneural.com slash dr lion you'll get 40 dollars off if you like this as much as i do please let me know i think this is a fantastic new product Welcome to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show, and I am very excited and maybe a little afraid to have my guest today, which is the legendary, epic Tony Blauer. He is a four, he's been doing this for four decades, combative expert, fear, aggression, violence. You are the man. I don't know. You make me blush. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I had a little birthday party and at the birthday party, there were a handful of highly trained military operators there and they were all in the corner like, Oh my God, <laughs> Tony Blower's here at your birthday party. It's so cute. <laughs> um, so you, you are the man and, um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation conversation. You are an expert in. Violence, fear, managing violence. and aggression. Managing, operating. Oh, not um, uh, well, providing. No, <laughs> well, I mean, that's part of it. Yeah. It's one of the answers, mm. you know, but it's, uh, it's very similar to what you do, you know, diagnose, treat, deploy, mm -hmm. the, you know, the right, the right protocols, the right prescriptions, the right whatever. But it's, it's the same thing about managing violence and it's got to be holistic and it's got to be it's got to be based on science physiology kinesiology psychology this is exactly why i was so excited to talk to you um there's this concept of brute force right and i think a lot of probably combatives and personal defense people think of it as just strength mm -hmm. navigation but you have a uniquely holistic approach which is a lot of psychology mm -hmm. behind how you navigate all of these domains let's start off with what is fear um well the way i look at it is very different than conventional i mean fear just the lay person you look it up fear is an emotion and uh the but i don't like talking about that stuff it's like i don't like 
you know, people, you know, I'll, I'll say, yeah, oh, there's Tony fear management. And someone will go, mm. yeah, fight, flight, freeze. And they just throw out the conventional stuff. Uh, a lot of the languaging around fear or even self-defense combatives is uh, post-mortem conceptual stuff. It's like, oh, look, that person fought, that person mm. ran, that person froze, or that person had fear. And that, you know, and a lot of it is really uh, clinical and which makes it um, inaccessible to lay people like me mm. and other operators and just general public, you know, good Samaritans. I reverse engineered a system because I lived with fear my whole life. Uh, as a good athlete, I was never hit that proverbial flow state because I was always afraid. Mm. Uh, you know, the question that always, I, I don't, I don't know that I silently said this, this eloquently now, but it was like, if I'm so good, why am I so scared? Cause as an athlete, like I felt like I deserve to be at bat or on the wrestling mat or about to do this gymnastics routine. But I'd be like, my heart's pounding butterflies, my stomach palms are sweating. And I'm like, if I'm so good, why am I so scared? And nobody really talked about the psychology of fear. And so where somehow I, I, and I can explain this better now than I did in the eighties, nineties, two thousand, whatever. Because in the eighties, you must have been looked at as a little bit of a rebel freak. Yeah. Well, this is, I was, I was through just intuition creating drills that were mocked by the conventional martial art. The, this is pre RBSD, which stands for reality based self-defense. Mm -hmm. I was mocked by the what were what were the the reality self defense systems back then. Isn't that interesting? I want to stop you because the people that are really exceptional at what they do out the gate aren't necessarily the ones They're that ridiculed. people agree with. Yeah. They're ridiculed. They're ridiculed until all of a sudden people understand they're genius right. and what they're doing is yeah fantastic. It, it, it's it's weird because my focus, well, the inspiration for my system came because. It's uh, and we'll be all all over the place with stuff, but I kind of want to like I can go with that story or or answer a little bit more of the fear and we'll we'll circle back. But it was this idea that that just saying things like believe in yourself, you can do it, uh, manage your fear, take a deep breath. Uh, everyone's afraid. I didn't understand why I was so afraid. I thought I was the, the most afraid person in the world. When I started developing the no fear program again, uh, you know, K N O W, of course people can see it on my shirt, but maybe there's an audio version of this. Mm. You know, we always had like the no fear t-shirts and I used to buy all of them because I wanted that to be the battle cry. I wanted to believe that you got good enough that you didn't have fear. And ironically, if the arena changes, the audience changes, the opponent changes, and there's a moment of self-doubt, that's the beginning of fear unraveling performance if you can't manage that. So it all became about managing fear. And, and at, uh, at some point, I was able to split, and this is intu intuition, because in the 80s and 90s, there weren't, nobody said myelinization of neurons, signal speed, deep right. practice, brain-based learning, interleaving, all of the neuroscience which I started to read later. I was like, can I swear on your show? Can we swear? <laughs> yeah. No? I mean, I, I, I was whatever like, you want, you can be yourself. I was like, holy fuck. This is what <laughs> I was doing in the eighties. Yeah. And it was like reading this white paper explanation was so exciting to me because it was liberating and vindicating. I'm, I'm more of a poet than I am uh, a fighter. And it, it really made me sad that people uh, ridiculed and criticized because all I was trying to do really was make people safer. That was my entire passion. I got asked by a venture capitalist when I was 20 years old. I, I was teaching this, uh, this really success. You know, I lived in Montreal at the time and I was teaching. I, I did hear your Canadian accent. Did you? Damn I did. I'm trying to wean it out. No, nope, I caught it. Um, and, uh, I was teaching this real estate moguls kid and he says to me, uh, he pulls me aside one day and he says, Hey, you know, what do you want to do, man? Cause you got the X factor. I'm 20 years old, 1980. I'm like, what's X factor. He says, I've taken karate. I've been in martial arts schools, stuff like that. You speak differently. There's something different going on here. That's the X factor. I said, okay, cool. Uh, he said, uh, I got a friend of mine who's into VC. So I'm like, what's VC? He goes venture capital. I'm like, what's venture capital? He's like, forget it. Just go to this meeting. I go to this, this, this meeting 
And the guy says, yeah, rookie's good. You got the X Factor. What do you want to do? I said, I want to make the world safer. Mm. And he looks at me and he goes, he leans back in his nice big chair and he goes, you don't think that's a little grandiose? And I'm like, why? But I like that was the mission, the mm. vision. Is it still that mission? No, 100%. Yeah. Probably now more than ever, we need it. More, uh, you know, if we open another Pandora's box here. I love Pandora's at, box. At, 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 there has never been a time in the history of the world mm -hmm. where people need to understand the connection between fear management and self-awareness and situational awareness. Mm -hmm. You cannot have critical thinking, which is obviously for over half of the world, completely like gone. But the you, we don't have critical thinking if we don't have self-awareness. Because if you don't have the self-awareness to go, wow, um, like this, this feels like propaganda. This feels like, like everyone's been screwed over in a relationship, screwed over in business. Like it's mm -hmm. one of the things I talk about. Hey, how many of you have been betrayed in a relationship? Every hand goes up. How many of you have been burned in business? Every hand comes up. How many of you, after the dust settled, said to somebody close to you, you know, I know that per I knew that person was going to fuck me. I knew that person was going to screw mm -hmm. me. And they all go, oh my God, yes. And I go, well, that's your intuition whispering in your ear. Intuition whispers in all of our ears, but our arrogance, our, 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 our need to be right, our prejudice, our just we're chasing the shiny yep. OCD ball. We go, no, I'll be okay. And then intuition's going, hey, I wouldn't go down the street. Intuition says, and I, I do this with like with athletes. I go, every time you've been injured, did you know just before the injury something was wrong? In like just before you about the deadlift, mm. did you go, man, is this too much weight? Did I warm up enough? A hundred percent of the time, people go, we don't teach people to listen to intuition. How would we do that? Just teaching it. It's mm. what we do. Yeah. I go, so, you, like in our system, and obvi obviously, as much as I like to is share, this, is this the spear system? It's part of the no fear program. The no fear program, okay. and it's the idea of how do you practice courage? Yeah. It's under that. How do you practice? And it's got to be micro doses of ideas, like where you're, where you're. But you can't do it without self-awareness. So well, let me ask you this. I have yeah. a question for you. I have a scenario. Um, I was thinking about this earlier as I was prepping for this interview. And I, I have a lot of questions like why do people initiate violence? And can you tell if someone is going to be dangerous or not? Um, one of the things that I'm very curious about is if someone experiences violence, let's say they were uh, outside and there was a shooting. Um, or if someone experiences violence, are they better at managing it the second time because they've been exposed to it? They were a witness or they were part of the... They were in. They were a victim to it. So it depends on the outcome. Mm -hmm. It depends on... Um, and it's like every story where, you know, two kids grow up under this abusive father or mother and one becomes a millionaire and writes a right. book and the other one is, is a serial killer. Right. It's like, um, you just never know. In fact, I was talking to somebody earlier today and, and we're, we're talking about fighting in general. I'm a nice, I'm really a nice person and, uh, I can flip the switch if I need to be violent, but there's a moment where I'm going, don't make me do this, where there's other people that like violence and like hurting people. And, and, you know, you don't know how you're wired with respect to violence. I know, uh, uh, cops who've been in gunfights who get tremendous PTSD, got to mm. leave the force. And then I know other cops that, are, and I interview everybody I know because I'm always trying to, there's no way I can experience all of the fear and violence and nor would I want to, but because I'm a trusted voice, mm -hmm. I need to talk to all of these other SMEs, subject matter experts, you know, and go, what were you thinking? What did it feel like? It could be a, a pro MMA fighter. It could be an operator. It could be whatever victim of violence. And you learn so much, but the most important thing is like, uh, as you have a, a gift for articulating things in a way, or you wouldn't, you'd, you wouldn't be invited on two podcasts if you sucked, <laughs> right? Like you couldn't ask questions or if you couldn't articulate. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I have that, that skill as well to explain in simple terms of people, you know, the neurobiology of survival and how to weaponize the startle flinch. Mm -hmm. Like that's a sexy sentence, mm -hmm. but then we've got really fundamental drills that go, Hey, look at this. 
This is your cross extensor chain. When your body gets scared, your hands come up, your fingers splay, your hands, if there's time and space between the threat, you'll push away danger. Mm -hmm. This is like an organic airbag. How cool is that? Your body is an organic air, you know, and people are like, oh my God. And then you do the drill. So I can explain all of that stuff. And back to your specifically your question, uh, each person, and I, I, I didn't, I, I wanted to insert this where I've talked to like a cop. Hey, you were just in a gunfight. You're right out of the academy. Are you okay? You know? And, uh, and remember that this, this one individual, a, a buddy of mine who is a chief of police, we we're talking about this guy that graduated. This guy comes out and starts shooting up the neighborhood, ends up killing three cops. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, they get into a shootout and this new graduate who's at home he's working nights he's at home uh with his kid and his wife is working here's the gunfire grabs his gun goes out he's wearing shorts like this tennis shoes orients on the threat the guy's three houses down shooting out you know into the street mm. my buddy mark who's the chief of police at the time uh his best friend his golfing buddy a friend his uh, cop 20 years uh one round hits the street ricochets up severs his femoral ar artery he bleeds out on the street yeah uh and and here's this kid he just graduated like a month earlier mm. who who drops this guy with like a three houses in a small suburb so like a like a 90 right. yard shot with a pistol he shoots the guy to the body the guy doesn't react to it so you realize he's got body armor on and then shoots him in the head oh, at 90 man. at 90 yards which is insane right yeah and uh um, but then he remembers his kids there. Cops are swarming on there. He runs back to the house. He's got Bugs Bunny on TV and he's oh, got his kid and he's bouncing his kid because he, he, and he just got in a gunfight. Martin, Mark's telling me the story because he knows I love the research and he sits down beside the guy and he goes, Hey, are you okay? And this rookie cop who knows that Mark's partner is now dead says I'm not his partner's best friend right says mark are you okay so mark's telling me so he goes i'm thinking this guy's like a like he's already got ptsd he's not even answering my question and he goes i'm okay are you okay and the guy looks at him and goes bring me another bad guy like like that's hmm. right so they're built differently yeah I, there are so, and the, the the seals are like that they're, yeah they're built so, for war so, so chronic stress can take a huge toll on the body. And, uh, you know, in this episode, I am talking to Tony Blauer and, and we're talking a lot about fear. While fear definitely can manifest in the body, one way to figure out if it's manifesting in your body is to look under the hood. That's why I want to thank one of the sponsors of the show, Inside Tracker. You can go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. If you've listened to my podcast and you have not yet done this, I strongly suggest that you do. You can look at your cortisol levels. You can look at your inflammatory markers. You can look at hormones. Inside Tracker can provide you with a personalized plan, looks to improve your metabolism, reduce stress, improve sleep, and really optimize your health for the long haul. For a limited time only, you'll get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lion and figure out what is going on under the hood. Yeah. So that's a, that's a huge thing. You know, I, I've I brought this up three times this week on different talk shows and, and conversations. One thing to my affiliates this morning, you know, I shared, you remember Wayne Dwyer? Mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he died uh, of leukemia. I don't, I don't, yeah, I, yeah. I don't remember how, how, um, and, uh, I remember listening to him once and he said, if you didn't know what you did and you looked at all the jobs in the world, what would you want to do and why aren't you doing it? And that blew me away. And then he goes on, he goes, if you didn't know where you lived and you looked at all the places you could live in the world, where, where would you want to live and why aren't you living there? Mm. Holy shit. And then the last one, if you didn't know how old you were and you looked in the mirror, how old did you think you were? And I share that and I get goosebumps whenever I share it because when you talk about people who are built differently, mm -hmm. it's somebody knows I want to be a Navy SEAL. I want to be 
in the unit. I want to be a cop. I want to be a firefighter. I, and, and they've figured out that purpose, passion, that direction. And, and then if they've got the right resilience and they've got the right coaching or mentoring from parents or guardians, uh, they'll execute on that. And that, you know, that changes everything in terms of, you know, all, all, all of, you know, how you look and where you live and your energies and, and, yeah. and all of that. But, uh, but this is kind of a really super long question is like someone experiences violence. There is a lot of research that says people who are attacked, if they fight back, even if they lose, they've got less trauma uh, because they fought back. So dignity, pride, you know, at least I fought back. I didn't, I didn't cooperate. So, mm. you know, that's an interesting thing. Uh, but I don't have like, like stats and I don't even, I don't even care. I, I, I uh, do you know Fletzy, the, the acronym Fletzy, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center? Uh -uh. I probably shouldn't say that out loud because I still do business with them from time to time. But I'll share the story. This is years ago. This thing probably disappeared. But they were trying to figure out a program that would assess somebody's survival quotient. I, I think that's amazing. So Interesting. Was, so is this is interesting. And tell me if you still find it amazing after <laughs> I tell you the story. I'm down there and there's like, 10 other SMEs that combatives, jujitsu, Thai boxing, boxing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I got the spear system. I'm there. And, um, like everyone wants the contract. Right. right. So, you know, Gabrielle, what do you think of this? I think it's amazing. Right. You know, uh, uh, Joe, what do you think of this? Oh, fantastic. I'm happy. I'll do whatever I can to be involved. They get to me. I'm number 10 and they go, what do you think of this? And I go, I don't know. I don't know. How do you, how do you measure that? And mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. And I say to one of the guys, I go, how many push-ups can you do? I go, seriously, like just bang them out, strict clean. He goes, 50. I said, how many push-ups could you do if I had a sawed-off shotgun to, do you have any kids? He goes, yeah. I go, you got a daughter? He goes, yeah. I got your daughter by the, by the ponytail. I jerked her head back and I got a fucking shotgun at her head. Can you do 51 push-ups? And you see, while I'm describing this, his face is like, you motherfucker. Like, you can see him get angry that I brought his daughter into this. I said, do you think you can do 50 or 51? I go, you want, you want to punch me right now, don't you? He goes, yeah, I do. I go, I think that that anger and that indignation gets you a couple more push-ups. And I looked at everybody. How dare we create some sort of like bell curve test mm. where we evaluate and we go, Hey, so you can't be on this elite team because your survival quotient wasn't 90 plus, but you can be a regular cop because you're in the 80s. Oh, sorry. Like, imagine like experts, me telling you, you come to training with me and I go, you go, so you think I'm ready? And I go, well, your front kick's great, your knee's great, but your survival quotient in terms of how your, your mind speed for yeah. processing stuff, you kind of suck. So I would just stay in the house, <laughs> right? You know, get a bodyguard. Um, I'm very holistic at that level. And then I recognized in the eighties, the people who manage their fear managed to fight. I've got gunfighting, ground fighting, knife fighting, multiple assailant programs. I got like, like 200 PowerPoints and keynotes, all this stuff from no room to shoot, no time to shoot, no need to shoot CQB courses, stuff that's influenced the highest level, uh, uh yeah, in the tier one communities. Yeah. And if you said to me, Tony, you're a physical guy, I've been physical my whole life. You can only pick one course of all of those, but that'll be the course you teach for the rest of your life. What's the coolest one? No fear. No fear. And, but I only realized that a few years ago. So the self-defense, uh, is, would you say, uh, on a very fundamental level, it's mental. The, the, the mind navigates the body. Like you got, you know, uh, uh, like I can teach you to kick and front kick and knee and elbow. No, and no, I have and, a hamstring and, injury, but but you know, with your other yeah, leg. Yeah. But uh, my point being is, everyone can learn how to shoot. Everyone can learn how to. But there's like cops in military. There's a there was a book you written years ago, Fog of War, World War Two era, of soldiers who were trained, qualified, but they would shoot high, shoot low, didn't shoot, they couldn't shoot another human. So it's so interesting. What I'm hearing you say is that how someone responds in the highest stimulus environment really determines their capacity. It has very little to do with their 
baseline skill. Everyone we assume has good baseline skill. I I say I'll, I'm going to be a little bit nerdy here for your you the yeah. This fixation on technique is the single greatest hindrance for mm. spontaneity in a violent encounter. One of my favorite maxims is don't confuse technical with tactical. And everybody spends time trying to get technical. Here's how I stand. Here's how I shoot. Here's where my thumb goes. If you look at, you know, let's say stats in, in uh, I don't have current uh, numbers, but it used to be like 15, 20% cops in, 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 in shootouts were at 15, 20% a- effectiveness accuracy. Mm-hmm. Bad guys way higher, but bad guys don't go to gun sight or go to shooting ranges. They shoot right. gang banger right. and they're running and, and you know, it's, it's crazy. But what they're doing is they're shooting without fear in the, in the performance sense, because they don't care if a round hits a kid, no one's counting, right? They don't care. So they're, they're fearless in the act of this asocial act where a cop or a military operator, depending on where, where they're operating is like, okay, we need to be exactly, we need to be aware where we're doing because we will be in this litigious world, which especially during the cancel culture, we need to be very focused on every single thing we could do. We do, and we got to be able to articulate this. Um, so, and this is something again, that I, I just intuitively figured out in, in the eighties is I was interested in measuring psychophysical response time, not how fast you could punch or kick. Mm-hmm. Everything works in a demo. So it's, it's and, I, and I, what I did is I ended up breaking down three types of speed when we're training people. And what is psycho? Psychophysical, like our, 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 the, the connection, the neuromuscular connection. So how long it would take, if I had a, a dangerous stimulus, how long so it would take you me to react? stimulus response, you have a refractory delay between yep. stimulus response. And mind speed is the most important thing. So if I, if, you know, if I asked you a question like, uh, and I'd come up with something stupid, uh, you know, uh, is this wood or is this arborate, you know, arborite? Do you know how to tell the difference? You might go, I don't know. Uh, but if I ask you a medical question, you'll spit shit out of me right away. Cause that's, that's your domain. Uh, so that's mind speed because you've studied and you've practiced, you blended the, the, the actual act. Uh, of it mm-hmm. and you you know the science and psychology behind all this stuff it's it's i i i, I have this fun um, kind of visual metaphor we've got handyman we've got a carpenter we've got an architect handyman comes over and you go hey i need you to fix uh, this shelf he goes yeah okay got it anything else yeah that wall over there the the plaster is always cracking checks it out he goes yeah this is like a sheet rock type thing i don't do that you need a carpenter for that carpenter comes over and he goes, yeah, I can fix that. I can repair that. You should really replace it. Uh, what's this patch here? You go, oh, this happens every few years. And he starts looking around and he sees this crack in the floor. He says, the reason that keeps cracking like that and you have to repaint it is because you've got some sort of foundation shift here. You need like an architect. Mm-hmm. You need somebody to look at this. This may be way bigger than me. But now that you've exhausted the handyman, you've exhausted the carpenter, and now you get to bring an expert. All three of them have toolboxes, but the architect, understands the big picture anyone who trains with me whether it's instructor level development because that's our our main business is training trainers military Mm. law enforcement and in the martial arts self-defense world um like everyone who graduates is like uh, like a budding architect they they understand the big picture of violence they understand what we call the timeline of violence if you so could you do you think that you one could predict you know, like I'm a mom of two, obviously you met my little kids and my husband is very capable at mitigating and managing violence. One would sure, hope, of course. but myself by myself with the two little kids, when I take them out, I, I am just being completely honest. It is always on my mind. Sure. It is very concerning in our society right now. I have two little children. How am I going to manage both? I actually very rarely go out with both of them. Right. What would you tell uh, a mom, I mean, someone like me, how do we plan for safety? And is planning for safety the same as planning for violence? Um, no, because violence is a very specific thing. You can have, you know, emotional. And have mothers asked you this before? Not like that. Mm. Not, not, you know, it's because you're smart, so you articulate differently, but, but, um, I paid him to say that. The, <laughs> the, uh, you know, it was funny. It reminded me to come back and give you a direct answer, but I just want to share this story with you, with your audience. I'm in, I forget where, teaching uh, a one-day Bureau and Bodyguard course. 
Do so your own body degree. Yeah. Okay. So, and what's interesting is like, I, I put together 20 years ago a course called Be Your Own Bodyguard. And the idea was, the, the, the hypothesis of the course was, you call me up and you go, hey, I heard you're really good at self-defense. I, I want to learn to defend myself. And I go, okay, great. Sign up. You know, you know, we're here. We teach five times a week. And you can do private lessons, semi-private. Okay, no, well, you don't understand. I, I kind of need to learn quickly. Okay, we can do an accelerated plan. Uh, you know, start off with 10 lessons. You know, the classic bullshit. <laughs> you go, no, no, you, you, you don't understand. I'm going backpacking alone in Europe. And I need to know what to do. Oh, well, we'll start training. Like, uh, you know, when can you come in? Well, I'm leaving uh, on Sunday and mm. it's Friday. So this hypothesis was, what could I teach you in a day? Yeah, which is great, which makes well, sense. Well, most people, I'm glad you say that, but most people confuse when I say, you can learn to defend yourself in a day. They confuse that with, you can learn martial arts in a day. Because yeah. you can't learn Krav Maga, you can't learn jiu-jitsu, you can't learn boxing, you can't learn Thai boxing, name every other martial art in a day. But what I can teach you is what bad guys want, what bad guys don't want. I can teach you to improve your situational awareness through improving your self-awareness. I can teach you de-escalation strategies and principles of, like I, I mentioned it earlier, you're already a human weapon, but you've been domesticated. Like, sure. like 150 years ago, uh, you knew, you know, which mushrooms would kill you and which ones get you high. You knew which food would, would, would kill you and which food would heal you. I arguably still know that. No, right. But, but the, yeah. You, you know, like you knew how to shoot a gun, right. you knew how to hunt, you knew how to fish. We've all been domesticated and, and that's a problem. So that, that's what compounds the fear. Uh, and this ties into, again, the, the whole fear management side, but really how do I make you safer sooner is I teach you to look at the timeline of violence, not the headlock, not the rape, not the gun in your face. And that's where everyone starts. And that's the single greatest mistake I think is because we get into like an extremely violent suggested scenario. And then we tell people, look, here's how you do a gun disarm. Here's how you get a headlock. And you're saying you want to avoid all that. Yeah. Yeah. We you want to de-escalate, avoid the violence. By the, being so, smart. so we have something called the three D's detect, mm -hmm. diffuse, defend, detect and avoid defuse, D E F U S E to take the fuse out, to disempower, defuse and de-escalate. And a push comes to shove. How do you defend yourself? The defend portion is, is, um, it's, it's, it's unique. It's, uh, built around what we call nonviolent postures and, and moving from a startle flinch. If I'm talking in a nonviolent posture, this is a Trojan horse metaphor. Mm -hmm. It facilitates de-escalation. But if, if somebody, what do you mean by that? Give me an example. Um, if I take a fighting stance, like you go, Hey, fuck you. And I'm like going, no, fuck you. And I don't want to fight. Like that's what a lot of people do. They go, get the fuck away from me. But their body language, which is 60% of communication suggests I'm getting ready to fight. Mm -hmm. So if you've got somebody who's, you know, not quite lucid and a lot of like violent people, whether it's a mental health issue, somebody's drunk, somebody's high, or they're just violent, uh, they're feeding off of that energetically they're feeding off that and if you look like a victim that'll attract them if you is that true people hear that all the time yeah okay well i mean it depends on the aggressor um like remember the story i told you when i was 12 yeah when i feigned fear and being injured my intuition said do this it was right and uh those guys took off like i might do that in uh, today with a certain group and they kick the shit out of me mm. because their intent was to do harm. Right. So you see like, like these, these mob attacks right. where people are kicking the shit of somebody who's already in, unconscious. Well, you know, clearly like that's a different type of predator. Right. But the big thing is like when I, when people ask me, Hey, what would you do here? What would you do here? Like the first thing I, I asked people was like, what the fuck were you doing there? Like if you look and that's the timeline of violence, the bigger picture, mm. Why are you going down the street? Why are you going to this mostly peaceful protest? Why are you, you know, uh, out alone or what or or whatever? And if and if you need to be, uh, this whole three Ds: detect, defuse, defend, is part of it. Listen, here's a really cool stat: every single victim of violence who has lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack. Every single one of them that I've talked to, in mm. every book that I've analyzed. Someone will go, when you peel the onion, yeah, and I knew something was wrong when, and I didn't, but then nobody's taught us or you that the moment you have a bad feeling about anything, health, finance, relationship, 
danger. Execute on that. Nobody teaches us right away, put a spotlight on it and explore it right away. And we call this the true safety model. So that's the overarching mm. uh, um, umbrella that guides our, our whole system is what is the safest thing I could do right now? Not to be confused with choosing, uh, sorry, of uh, playing it safe. Playing it safe is boring. <laughs> choosing safety. Oh, you're a base jumper. What is the safest you know, line that you're going to jump on? Did you check your shoot? You know, did you check the weather? What are the safest things you can do? If right. I would never do that, but I give a, like no. that crazy, that crazy, crazy example. Crazy um, people. <laughs> if Just if you were going to move towards the danger, yeah. And I give this example: you're in a room and an active shooter comes in and starts shooting. Yes. Should you play dead? Should you run out the back what, door? What, what should, should you, you do? charge a threat? Well, when you ask yourself, what is the safest thing I could do right now? Your brain starts to go, what about this? What about this? And it starts to spit out ideas. So, in our system. By having a Socratic question lead every potential strategy and tactic, you, 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 you start to kind of like stimulate both, both sides of your brain. And that's what we want. We don't want it to be rote. And the joke I make is like... That's interesting. So you don't want to have a plan, you know, so there's an active shooter, someone's at a school, there's an active shooter, uh, immediately get out of there. And that's just... Well, no, you, you can have a plan, but, but the, mm. the plan has to also... Uh, have a contingency, a, a plan B, and there's like famous maxims. I'm sure you've heard it. And I'll, I'll, I'll screw it up right now, but <laughs> you know, no plan survives first contact, right? right? Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. so if if you're uh, hyper vigilant on your plan, I get you in a headlock, and you go, I know the counter of the headlock, but it doesn't work. What are you going to do? Are you are you like oh, fuck. oh no? Are you panic or do you go okay? In my training, I considered this not working and it would escalate or I would change or I would do this. So let me ask you this. You've gotten so good at navigating, I mean, more situations than anyone is ever going to be in ever. Have you played those out in your head? Is it just been, you know, do you do that now? I mean, cause you must have gone through it. It, it's, Every a, it's single an interesting experience. question, and and I don't know that I've done it more than anyone, but I've done it a lot. You've done it a lot because because every uh, we created a principle also in the eighties. That was my kind of incubator period mm -hmm. where I was just figuring out stuff. We do something, we and call also, it. can I just point out the obvious that maybe people are not appreciating the reason you've gotten so good at fear is because it impacted you. Yeah. So, so and deeply. I like to always not not to be you like know? a stick a stickler. I always like to insert managing fear, um, because fear is just is or it isn't. Nobody has like three good days in a row and like this is a good week. Hmm. Tomorrow's Friday, right? You know what? I hope something catastrophic happens Friday so I can practice my resiliency. Like nobody, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, that would be real. Right? That like was... nobody wants that that roller coaster ride, but life is that roller coaster yes. ride. So. I've gotten good at managing fear. I've I've experienced horrific shit in business. My family experienced a home invasion at gunpoint. I wasn't there. I've experienced violence. Mm -hmm. I've I've uh, uh, had uh, a business t like taken from me. You know, like a, a that was doing twelve million dollars, and like a week later was gone. Uh, shit that that. Like other people, like you know, take their lives over or right. take someone else's lives over. Uh, I've had to rebuild, uh, and so I feel like like all of those create fear uh, at, at so many levels. So I've gotten good at at managing fear, and that's really the message: is that there are lots of things in life you have to do scared. I, uh, you know, I raised my son. I got custody him when he was three months old. I didn't know you don't put babies to sleep with a bottle filled with milk. I didn't know it's going to destroy their, his mm. teeth. When he's like three years old, his teeth are all messed up. And doctor looks at that and he goes like, he needs, this needs to be fixed. And he's got to go under. And they don't like to do that at right. three, four no, years definitely old. Not. Definitely not. And uh, so I'm feeling guilt and shame. Like, holy shit, what a moron I am. I just, and what if something happens at, he's now four years old. You know, they make you sign the waiver. Hey, like he could die from this. Scary. And and I'm there. My heart's racing right now, just reliving that. But like, 
Like that's fear management going, he needs to do this because this could get really worse and really do damage. And he needs that and that could kill him. Oh my God. And, and I remember um, thinking, okay, what would, if somebody hired me as a fear management consultant, what would I tell them? I would tell them, look, this is scary, but it's a choiceless choice. You're going to do it and you're going to do it afraid. Also, what we learn by this, by this point uh, from all the scenarios we're doing is that you can create adaptation, stress inoculation by replicating a scenario as closely mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, I'm going to replicate this experience so I don't pass out at the hospital in front of my son or throw up on him on the way there. And what I did is I went to the hospital uh, either the day before or several days before and did a run through and I took him and I said, we're going to come here. And I did a scenario with him mm. and he was scared. Dad, what's going to happen here? What's going to die? I might start crying right now, but, but I walked him through, I explained to the nurses, I said, look, he's out of your, you know, out of your shot. I said, I'm scared to death. I wanted to see where we're going. I want to see, I wanted to see these events. So in his mind, that's very conscientious. It was, that's very it conscientious. Was horrifying, but I was like, you know, do you do that now? do what like scenarios yeah if i if i if i i mean this is you know you know metacognition abstraction i've done i've done so many uh concepts so i just do this and mm. i i i but i've also gotten to the point where i just I mean, go, you've been doing this a very long time 43 years I had, a, I had a cop in my class in carlsbad actually uh about a decade ago and i i had my team there were like 40 cops doing our spear cert and I had a team teaching. I, didn't, I wasn't live, living here yet, so it was over 12 years ago. Where, where were you guys living before? Uh, Virginia Beach for two or three years, uh, and then Montreal, uh, Canada. And uh, I come in to visit, you know, and, and do like a little mm -hmm. ask me anything, and guys are asking me stuff. Then one cop at the back, hand up. I go, yes, sir, one more question. What is it? He goes, I just want to say, Mr. Blower, it's don't call me Mr. Blower. I keep looking around for my father, <laughs> right? And he goes, I just want to say that uh, – you know, when I was like 15 years old, I read about you in Black Belt Magazine. I saw your Panther production tapes. And uh, and I knew I wanted to be a cop back then. And uh, I can't believe I'm learning your system now. And I just wanted to say, and I'm like, I'm like, that's it? You wanted to tell me that you were watching, when you were 15, you knew about me? I said, dude, you just gave me more gray hair. Ah. Sit down. Like, just been around a long, long time. Uh, and, um, but it's cool. I love love helping people understand that life is going to present you with a choiceless choice. And if you're a cop, if you're military, if you're a mom, if you're dad, you're whatever, and it doesn't have to be it, it. It And that's why I said the no fear program is so huge to me that the fastest way to understand and manage fear is by studying violence because violence, the fastest way to understand and manage fear is by studying, studying violence. violence. Because violence loves speed. Mm. If I said to you, oh, you got to turn... What about other fear? For example, the fear that is nonviolent, like the... Spider snake. Yeah, uh, or anything. the example of going to the hospital with your, yeah. with your son. Um, you know, it's like we were talking offline. I'm afraid of certain procedures and yeah. things like that, certain medication. I don't want to do it. But, like, I'm afraid of heights, but I've gone skydiving. That's mm. fear management. I'm going to do this. I have to do this now. So if somebody said to me, hey, hey, we got to get out of here. We're flying, and then we got to jump to get back into the safe area. The fact that I'm afraid of heights doesn't mean I'm not going to put on a parachute and jump out of the airplane. Right. That's what I'm teaching people. It's like, oh, you're afraid to public speak? That's okay. You're going to do it afraid. Oh, you're afraid to give birth? That's okay. Oh, you're afraid to you fight? Do think it gets easier? Of course. Well, again, it's personality-driven, but yes, it does. Based on – and there's no, like, like number – Frequency, the more you do anything, the better you get. But this is a neat thing, too. Another one of our, our models. I don't know. My daughter's still afraid of the dark. How old is she? I'm just teasing. But three. Almost three. three. She's three. Well, <laughs> if when she's 33, she's still afraid of the dark, you know, come see. Yeah. Me. yeah. But it's, um, but there's, you know, there's, there's ways to help stress inoculate people. Uh, and, and it's, and it's exposure without creating trauma. Exposure without creating trauma.
Yeah. So that's how we do scenarios. Like if we, if I did like, if I put on our high gear suit and I did a scenario with you mm -hmm. and you like pass out because I scared the shit out of you, you know, did I empower you or create more trauma? Um, I had a, uh, a woman. I don't know. I think that anytime you experience something that's ad ad adversary or that you haven't done before, you immediately will become better at experiencing Only, the second Well, that's time. your personality because there are, um, like, for example, my wife, Jessie, who you know, she, she's had mild and serious anxiety for years. And because she had, I think she was one years old, she needed a tracheotomy. And so anytime she gets a sore throat or any swelling in the throat, mm. immediately, and she can't do anything about it, maybe she needs a hypnotist. Of course, she won't talk to me <laughs> about it. I'm her husband. But... Uh, so we, I didn't know this for years. We're trying to do workout and I know that the greatest adaptation in training is like, if you push yourself, you've got it. You can't just do nice long anything, walks, right? In anything. Right. In anything. But particularly like if you want to create metabolic change in your body, you need to, some of your workouts need to be, you got to like, they got to be really uncomfortable. Right. And, um, and so like one day I'm like, why aren't you? like moving faster on this sprint, on this deadlift, on this, whatever it is. And finally she says to me, I'm afraid that, and I, and I believe this, like when someone goes, I don't want to do that because if you ask those seven questions, eventually they're going to say, cause I'm afraid. And that's why I say fear mm. throttles everything we do. It's unconscious. And it's like this filter in your mind of why you don't want to do something. Mm. So creating that self-awareness, like does that save time? If I look at you and go, look, I'm afraid to do this. Here's why. And you go, Okay, you're gonna. You're, we're gonna make you do it, and you're gonna do it afraid, and then I'll hold your hand, right? But it doesn't necessarily feel any better. You still have to do it, right? You know, and then there's some people that just don't care. Like yeah. I, like I know, like I hate confrontations. This is ironic because I'm a confrontation yeah. man. It's I think specialist. that is somewhat ironic. And but it also explains why our program is so holistic, because I'm because it is ironic. I, I, there's a, there's a, a deeply metaphysical and spiritual side to it. It's so I have a, like a buddy of mine. I, I had a thing where I go, man, I can't believe it's happening. I got another guy ripping me off my system. Like, man, I hate this shit. I got to call, call my lawyer, cease and desist. God, I hate these. And he's got this big grin on his face. He goes, really? He says, I love that. I love taking people to court. I look, and I'm like, why would you love that? He said, it just, it reminds me that I'm alive as a businessman and people are fucking with me. And I'm like, and I'm like going, wow, those are completely two different paradigms. Now, both of us are su successful. Right. I'm jealous that because I get like, I wish I was wired that way. Mm -hmm. Is that because his dad was that way or his business school or whatever. So a lot of it is, is really personality driven, but that doesn't change the roller coaster of life of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyways, with the, let me finish the thing with Jesse. When she says, I'm afraid that if I get out of breath, I'll pass out. And if I pass out, I'll, I'll, I don't want to pass out because my throat. And and I'm like, holy, like I never knew. I'd be going, come on, let's go faster. She goes, this is fast as I'm going. And it wasn't until I understood she was afraid to push herself because she was afraid. Mm -hmm. And it was something, it was something uh, uh, again, that PTSD element of almost dying as, as a one-year-old kid that she hadn't shaken or cleared. Mm. Um, it's very fascinating. It, yeah. The whole thing's fascinating. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank First Form, one of the sponsors of the show. And you guys know that I love this company. And one of the things that is so important about being strong, and again, not being fearless, but being capable is having a body that works. And one of the reasons I love First Form is they have a whole bunch of supplements that I think are incredibly valuable. And one of my favorites is Microfactor. And for all you busy executives, athletes, students, Microfactor comes in a box with 30 packs, okay? This means it's easy. It has antioxidants, multivitamin, it has a CoQ10, essential fatty acid, a fruit and veggie blend. There is no excuse for you not to take this vitamin. Again, microfactor, we don't get the nutrients that we need. This is a very easy way to do it. 
You can go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. You'll get free shipping nearly everywhere in the U.S. And also if you have a military address, the customer service with this company is the best that you will ever experience. So if you want to try something new, if you're not eating as healthy as you should be, you're very busy, try Microfactor. It is easy, accessible. You have you get one pack, so you get 30 packs. You take one of these packs with you. You get all your vitamins and minerals. It is a great strategy for execution. Again, that's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. Go to their website, read all about it. I, I, I'm very curious as to how, how we plan for safety in the way that you did combatives. Do you think that obviously we're not going to learn martial arts in a year, but there are probably a handful of moves or top three moves that a mom should know or someone, every civilian yeah. should know. So, so is that true? I mean, I believe, I believe it like, so you practice self-defense every day. Everyone watching this practices self-defense every day. You brush your teeth. That's a type of self-defense, right? You don't want like, like hygiene issues and you try to eat good food. That's Mm -hmm. self-defense. Do you run across the street? Like we're on a crazy street here. And how you, do you run across the street or do you? Do you look to make sure you're not going to get run over by a cyclist or some nut speeding down the highway? That's self-defense. You get a stomachache. You get a toothache. I started to say this before. Every problem in your life can be solved by another subject matter expert, another expert that you can call. My roof's leaking. I could YouTube how to fix it, but I'm not interested. Could you fix my roof? Right. Could you fix my car? Could you fix my tooth? Could you fix my stomach? Could you fix my budgeting, my finances? There's only one problem in your life that you can't outsource, and that's sudden violence. You don't even time to dial 911 if it's happening. Right. right. Um, and so, you know. And that's probably happening more now than ever before. Yeah, it's out of control. I mean, you just see the news, just broad daylight, brazen. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really a shit show out there. But that didn't change in the 80s. I would say, look, every man and woman and child that's old enough to comprehend what they're doing needs to and should learn how to detect and avoid dangerous situations, how to de-escalate situations they can't avoid. How do you, how do you people de-escalate situations? I mean, I know this is such a broad question. Yeah. So we have a whole program called Choice Speech mm-hmm. where you there's a whole series of behavioral observations that, it, once again, like, why do I know this shit? I don't know. Right. And I figured it out. Uh, but how do you create conscience and accountability in somebody? How do you create rapport? You know, I see. If so it is some kind of negotiation. There, yeah, it, it it's, happens quickly. And and there's a shift in there. Uh, another part of the program is called the three eyes: instincts, mm-hmm. intuition, intelligence. How do you how do you trust your instincts? How do you listen to your intuition? Because your intuition is like you know something to be true, but you don't know why it's true. Right. And that's the true safety reminder. It's like. I introduce you to somebody and I go, Hey, this guy's going to give you a lift home. And then you're about to get in the car and you get this really, really bad feeling. Mm. But you go, but Tony said, you know, but I might be in on it, right? Like, do you, how do you trust your intuition? Do you find as you navigate the world, are you more vigilant or less vigilant than you used to be? I, I have been doing this so long that I really trust the three eyes. I go somewhere. And there was a, and I, and, and I so you didn't come over to my birthday party looking for exits. No, <laughs> no. And it's, and it's funny because there's a part of me that goes, and this is the craziest thing. I just lost my mom last year. So I'll mm-hmm. put this in context. I used to say for decades in our seminars, I'd go, how many of you could drop your mother in a fight? And everyone in the room would go, the fuck did he just say their yeah. face was yeah, yeah, yeah. like the audacity of even suggesting right. that. How many of you could punch your mom in the throat? Just Never. drop her. Never. And people are like, what? I go, how many of you are in shock that I asked that question? And people are like, where's this going? How many of you know that almost every mass murder is committed by a known family member? How many of you realize that if somebody who's in your inner circle, in your circle of trust, walks into a room with a gun or a knife or a flamethrower, 
that you're not going to go key eye and hit a stance and kick it out of their hand. You're going to be like, mom, dad, crazy uncle Joe, what the fuck are you doing with a gun in here? Your brain is incredulous and you just stand there while they do whatever they're going to do. And everyone's like looking at me. I go, so listen, if my mother walked into a room that I was in and she had an ax in her hand, we better be in the country. We better be camping. And the words coming out of her mouth better be, I need you to chop more firewood. Something must be congruent. Everything needs to line up. Three eyes. If I'm in my uh, apartment in the city and I get out of the shower and then I see my mom with an ax, it's no longer my mom. It's something happened to my mom and it's a person with an ax. Mm. And I've, like, I've thought about that. Where, where did I get that from? Like, that sounds insane. From studying other people's violent encounters and just like i remember i was at i was at quantico doing something with the fbi and they got a library there of, of all this like research books and stuff that you don't find in barnes and nobles right. and i'm sitting there the online card catalog right, yeah and I'm, and I'm reading stuff and i'm going holy shit holy shit and in all these stories and all these debriefs this is written by detective so and so that cracked this case then yeah. like nobody's talking about the potential behavioral manipulations of the aggressor that might have created an opportunity to buy time to mm. shift psychological gears. So like I talked about the three D's and you were talking about de-escalation. I'm in a non posture and they're going, Gabriel, calm down, let's take it easy. And I'm really trying to morally, ethically, legally diffuse it. And then suddenly I go, holy shit, she just looked at that knife on the table. She's moving towards it. The de-escalation is not working. We're going to fight. She's going to try and kill me. In our system, mm. because of the Trojan horse, I don't change my stance, but now I change I my my psychological gears. I see. And that is part of the magic of the system. I've got to manage my fear, my self awareness. That's probably the most important. My self awareness and situational awareness yeah. are, <coughs> excuse me, are now dialed in. I can hit my indignation button, which is part of the training that how dare you energy. Big, huge. So the how dare you energy waste time. Say that one the more time. indignation that how dare you energy that's a time waster. No, the indignation that's the supercharged button. I see. If I said to you, oh, I see the how dare you, and then it yeah, amps yeah. you up like let's go. So yeah, exactly. So, so if you. I said to you, would you defend yourself if you walked out on the street? You go, I don't know. That's why can I set up a lesson? If I said to you, someone's about to grab your kid. Before I se- finish that sentence, you go. I'm, I had a woman in one of my seminars, I go, you come home and someone's doing this to your kid and these women start screaming and one of them says, yeah. her carotid popping from her throat. Oh, how dare you put that, I'll rip his fucking heart out. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I said, whoa. I said, you know, that's medically impossible, but I love where your head's at, right? But <laughs> right. she just locked. Yeah. But a minute before, a minute before I'd asked, I'd asked uh, the group, how many of you would defend yourself against Albert Salvo, the Boston Strangler? And before you answer, he raped 2,000 women, then got bored with that, and then murdered, and then raped 12, 12 women. He's, you know, uh, 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 was it necrophiliac when you, you, you rape dead bodies? I don't know, whatever. whatever. It, but they were all like, I, sh- I scared them because I said, Albert Salvo, Boston Strangler, 2,000, you know, Brutal. rapes. He was really good. Uh, ex-military boxer and they're like holy shit. he was five foot seven piece of shit coward would scare and manipulate people mm-hmm. into and when they caught him they they said hey like did you rape everybody you tried he said no only the people that cooperated oh my god so i come in and i come in i go if you cooperate with me i won't murder you and you go okay and anyone who fought or resisted screamed you know flailed he took off because bad guys don't want to get caught they don't want to get Bad guys don't want to get caught. Are there things that, yeah, you know, when, when someone enters into violence, the assaulter, there's probably things that they want and things that they don't. Yeah. Bad guys only want one of three things, property, body, life. It's a super short list. It's scary. Property, that body, life. That is scary. But when the list is short, you can make decisions faster. Hmm. Learning self-defense is scary, but it's no, like... Like I liken it like this, and I want to tell people that you know you can't learn to defend yourself in a day. I said, don't confuse martial arts for learning the principles of self defense. Detect and avoid, defuse and de-escalate. It puts comes to stop, defend. <clears throat> Would you think it weird to take a stop the bleed class, add a burn on a tourniquet, CPR, mouth? No, to mouth, I've done all this. Right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And 
So imagine a doctor running into a four hour, you know, first aid course being taught by a paramedic and going, look at you, you can't learn this in a day. I went to, I went to medical school for 10 years. To, that'd be ridiculous. But that's what martial artists do when they hear about a, a one day right. course. I'm like, whoa, you can learn how to use a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you a fireman. Right. You can learn how to return a kit. It doesn't make you a paramedic, but a paramedic isn't a doctor either. Right. So I, I put on a tourniquet, a paramedic fixes that, gets me to a hospital. Another expert tries to fix it. We're all trying to buy time to get the safety. Choose safety. What's Choose the safest safety. thing you can do? So go ahead. So you think it's smart that, uh, you know, selfishly, I'm, I'm asking this, that I don't go out with both children at once. I see a lot of No, I don't, do I don't like that. It depends on where yeah. you're at. I don't like that because you're changing how you parent. Hmm. Uh, here's, here's a line for you. I mean, I spend time with both of them equally. I, I get it. I just never want to but, put... But you should be able to go to the beach with yeah. both kids. Now, um, I understand that if you go, look, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to I want to teach my this this little one how to swim and be not afraid of the surf. There's no way I can do that and watch my kid. I turn around and the scroller's gone. Or I turn around mm. and, you know, he's wandered off or whatever. Right. So, like, in that case where you know your attention is going to be split, mm -hmm. I don't like the idea that it's fear-based in some cases. But if it's – so fear can teach us a lot of cool strategies. I would say it's more protection-based. That's a great reframe. From my, from my perspective, it's not that I'm afraid to do it. It's that I want to be smart in a way that I am out there with my children in this crazy world. I yeah. want to be able to protect both of them. Yeah. Listen, if if – the, the only, and it may be an age thing, like when they're seven and eight. Because they're you know. so little yeah, right yeah. now. I mean, I, I, th there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. and, and your your mental reframe is healthy. This is, yeah. and I love that protection versus fear. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I don't have a problem. I, mm. You know, like, I mean, but what do I know? Um, just, <laughs> a lot. Just a, a, yeah. a uh, well, custody of that, my son um, since day one. But mm. what do I know about parenting? I'm joking. <laughs> a lot. Right. What do you think about, you know, there's, I have concerns about social media's influence on violence. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. Yeah. It, it almost like it desensitizes us to, to violence. Well, we're ways. getting desensitized. We see, yeah. we see shit all over. But not the place. in a positive way. It's almost like no. it's feeding ideas. And it's the same thing. My buddy, uh, Dave Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman mm -hmm. wrote a book called stop teaching our kids to kill. And it's maybe 10, 15 years old, maybe older about how video games are, you know, there, there's kids that are shoot video games and they get a gun and go shoot right. student and they're, and they're nailing people with headshots from, because they're eye hand coordination and they, yeah. they're just, they don't care. They've killed thousands of people in the game and they're, and maybe they, whatever mm -hmm. that might seem like an extreme thing. Uh, it's, it's weird because, uh, like I played those games and it, like I go, this is not making me more violent, you know, like, right. like I think it has to do with you. I, I think, I think, th I think humans have been hacked. I think the, uh, big tech companies have figured out how to hack us mm -hmm. and there's an unintended consequence with all the dopamine and all, all that shit. But we don't, we like, there's no critical thing and people are just fucking idiots right now with, with what they believe. Like even, I know this in the last three years, I'm not going to name names and talk specifics, but weren't you like startled by how many people you thought were really lucid and intelligent who were just following a party line without mm -hmm. like, going, wow, I really thought this person, but now they're angry with me because yes. I'm asking a question about this and they're mm -hmm. like, what happened to like the discussion? Mm -hmm. So, um, well, the, the whole goal of this podcast is to have these kind of transparent conversations. Mm -hmm. I think that we need your skill now more than ever, not saying that the eighties weren't violence, but I think there's not just physical warfare that's happening, but there is psychological warfare. 100%. Fear has been weaponized. It has been. And it's, um, you know, I'm concerned for my children. I'm concerned for the world oh God, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm the same way. Because if I think about it too long, I get very sad. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, if I could wave a magic wand, listen, I had a, a buddy of mine who will freak in his son will, if I mention his name on here, so I'm not going to Aaron. <laughs> so Aaron's my tattoo artist in, in, uh, in Vegas, follows my work, loves my work. 
I just saw him in a son of a camp this summer, uh, this summer, this, this past weekend. And, uh, his son was, is 10 and Aaron calls me one day. He says, look, man, the mask, they're playing sports. They live in Vegas and you know, it's 110 degrees, whatever. They're making them do sports with mm. the mask on. He's developing anxiety. His personality is starting to change. Mm. He, no one has seen a smile in two years. And he says, does your, cause we have a, an online, no fear. And then of course I go out and I work with people individually on zoom and, and, you know, with teams and whatever. And, um, he says, is, is your no fear program too old for him? And I say to him, I go, dude, do you want your son to be raised and educated by a Marxist socialist communist like mm. teacher? I mean, the school system's so fucked up right now, you know, not all teachers, but a lot, you know, I understand. and I said, you're his dad. Is the program too old for you? He goes, well, well no. I go, you need to mentor and coach your son. You're his dad. Don't leave it up to the school. You see this. You need to intervene. You need to. You've recognized it. And you're going to do no fear. And you're going to determine, because I don't know your son. I'd never met him at this time. What is age appropriate to him? What he will grasp. And um, I got, I I should bring it, but I'll I'll, I'll pull it up. Um, I've got the letter. Uh, But it's amazing. Uh, then the next time I was back, about a, two months later, I was back in Vegas for some business and went to his place to get a tattoo. And um, he says, um, hey, Salem asked me to give you something. And he hands me a letter and I get a handwritten letter. When's the last time you got a handwritten letter? A handwritten letter from a 10-year-old hmm. thanking me for the No Fear program. And in it, he says, so one of our strongest lines is this, you can't be brave if you're not afraid. I love that. The primary ingredient in a bottle of courage is fear. If I say to you, oh my God, you're so brave to jump off that building with that wingsuit. If someone goes, no, I'm a 22 year old, uh, you know, Red Bull athlete with a death wish. I love it. Going oh, that, t- that requires no courage or bravery because right. I'm not right. afraid. Mm. Somebody who is terrified, but that's, that's their calling. They want to do it. And I started to uh, tell this story and I forgot the guy's name. He's a world famous uh, base jumper. And remind me to come back to Salem, please. Um, world famous base jumper. And uh, Red Bull is doing a documentary on him. And he's up in some mountains in Switzerland or whatever. Mm-hmm. They've got a team. They've got other jumpers ready to go. They've got helicopters. They're gonna. They're filming all this shit. He gets up there. He's world class already. He's been jumping for right. years, thousand jumps. And he stops. He goes, um, no jump today calling it off mm. and they're like what are you talking about like though this is like whatever the set you know right. you got cameras and film like maybe it's fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a day i make it up the number but it's yeah, it, yeah. it's expensive he goes no i got i got a bad feeling about this here's a guy who learned trust your intuition that's incredible and what's important for everybody listening to this is is he has the skill he's got the accolades he's got the pedigree yeah. he's got the reputation but he went something's off today Mm. and I'm going to listen to that because that's choosing safety. Oh, you're scared. What do you mean scared? I've done a thousand, this a thousand times. I am reading whatever you can't see. I'm feeling that energetically. I'm not, I'm not going to go. And who knows what it is. Uh, But that's the whole thing is there's no downside to choosing safety, but there's a huge downside to being arrogant or bravado and go, well, fuck it, fuck fear and and no fear and and charging and charging Mm -hmm. in. Back to Salem real quick. This this letter, but he says in this, I can't thank you enough to teach me for teaching me how to be brave instead of, well, you know, you can't be brave. You're not afraid. The quote, he says, uh, my dad and I have been doing your program every week and, um, I love doing this with my dad. We talk about things that, you know, and I realized in that moment and I started to cry in, mm. in, in the shop there. And then, and then Aaron starts to cry and I'm going, dude, you can't tattoo me while we're crying. Like, right. Right? and, uh, and I, 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 in that moment, I realized like I didn't have a good relationship with my dad, that here's a 10 year old kid and their dad discussing fear management as it applies to life. See, the whole thing with fear management is that, it's a formula for how do you handle any fear in your life? It's not just a fight. That's what I love. Mm-hmm. And, and so suddenly you're, you're, you're walking 
And then, boom, a stimulus gets introduced too quickly. You're like, what the fuck's this? Immediately, there's doubt, hesitation, procrastination. That happens for everybody. If you don't have an organized formula for recognizing, I just went from parasympathetic to sympathetic. I noticed all my body changes. Mm. Or I'm avoiding this. What's going on? If you don't know how to break that down and diagnose it the same way you, you'd read a blood test and go, well, dude, you're low in vitamin D and right. iron. That's why you feel like shit. And this is what, right. you know, if you, you need to be able to self, that's why I said self, self-awareness is the gateway to critical thinking. Mm. And the, uh, then the gateway to self-awareness is understanding how to manage fear. And then here's a, a heavy one. And I love this. And I, I use this in our, in our business consulting What's the only resource we can't regenerate? Time. Yeah. When you're in the fear loop, you're consuming time. Because I walk in, have you ever walked in a room and seen somebody, they got a cloud over their head they're like this, and you go, hey, are you okay? And they go, yeah, why? What's up? They're oblivious. And then three days later, they go, I didn't want to tell you, but you know, I lost our money on this, or right. the company closed, or I right. uh, got this test back, and I don't like, I don't like what I see. But that was three days yeah. waited. So when you understand how to manage fear, ah, you actually time. manage time. Fear management is time management too. Tony Blauer. Crazy, right? You are amazing. Thank you. I don't know about that, but you are. It's, it's like like it's all stream of consciousness zone. It's just what I I wake up at three in the morning. I write shit down. Hope I can read it in the morning. Pretty pretty interesting. Um, the level of mastery that you've brought forth and you know there is a i don't want to say a spirituality behind it but there is there there's is. A, a it's not just about brute force or being a knuckle dragger there is a whole spiritual kindness thank you servant, for recognizing that. servant leadership thank you for recognizing that it's it's weird because i'm in a in a in a very type a mm-hmm. community and um you know I, I had a cop who's been training with me for years He's on a SWAT team and he came around, uh, got sucked into a garage. Guy ran into there, opened the door. And when someone opens the door, they're, they need to get in the car as a pre-contact cue to show they're trying to get away. He opens the door and his arm reaches in, which means he's going for a weapon. And uh, Jim's at the back of the car. And he's got his long gun as he's coming around. And he knows he's, he can shoot. He knows the guy's going for a gun. And uh, uh, he goes immediately because he's got six feet to cover. He's on the move. He, he draws his weapon back and teaches this move we teach off of long gun. We mm. call no shoot, no time to shoot, no need to shoot. And he knocks the guy out into the car, dislocates his shoulder, just smashes him into the car. But he wrote me a letter that night saying that, uh, thanking me in the system because he doesn't want to kill somebody if he doesn't have to. Right. But like how self-aware as a cop, yeah. right? Uh, and so there is a spiritual side to the system that can we manage violence and that includes the violence on somebody who's having a mental crisis, Mm -hmm. somebody who grew up like hating everybody because they got psycho parents. You know, there's another quote, uh, you know, the nothing uh, affects a child's life more than a parent's unlived life. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that before, I think, did I mention, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that ties into like, like your passion, your purpose. But there was uh, another one, and this is the stuff that I, I, I learned and gleaned, when I got custody of my son, I was like, what am I doing? What, what do I need to read? What do I need to know? And uh, there was another one that blew my mind and kind of helped me navigate it all. And that is um, uh, unknown psychologist said, I always like to meet the parents. It helps me forgive the children. <laughs> Isn't that heavy? That's deep. And, yeah. and, and so the, so the, this, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's, it's uh, this idea that, and I, I say this almost every week somewhere. I wish there was no violence on the planet because I'd have to get another job. <laughs> and I and I'd be good with that. Yeah, I, yeah, I figured yeah. it out. I wish there was no violence. Yeah. I abhor it, which is why mm. I study it and practice it. So I don't have to I don't have to watch it happen. I can do something, be a courageous bystander, or protect myself from my family. Thank you so much. Thank you. For your time and everything you're doing and Thank you. This was fun. Yeah. And I will link everything in terms of where they can find you. And thank you so much. Thank you.